Secretary Maria Antonio Yulo Loisaga from the Philippines, distinguished guests at the Ecosperity Week, as well as the Philanthropy Asia Summit, our hosts from Tomasek. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for inviting me to join you at this opening dinner. You've already had a full day of productive discussions, and I know you're looking forward to the next two days. And we've just heard a very good speech from uh, Dylan uh, as well. So I think I can be most useful by making a few remarks of a, of a broader nature. First, we have a glass that's half full, but it is only half full. We are making progress. I mean, it's not often recognized that we've made very significant progress from where we were before Paris in 2015 to COP28 last year. Very significant progress in thinking as well as actions. And companies have moved to, not just governments. Even companies in countries or states within countries which deny climate change are making very significant progress. So there is progress. But we have, we have to be frank. There is still, around the world, a prevailing culture of inaction or wanting to postpone action in the hope that things get better or in the hope that public support for government actions will get stronger in the future. The temptation to postpone action is still deep set in societies around the world and in politics around the world. But there's equally a risk of the opposite. And we do see the opposite, which is to talk the worst, to talk about the catastrophe that's coming and hope to shock or scare people into action. We face both these tendencies, hoping that things will turn out to be better or public support would somehow improve in the future, as well as expecting the worst. And both breed inaction. Both these tendencies breed inaction. Most studies show that simply scaring people by talking about catastrophe or driving people to despair does not lead to action. It leads to lying flat. It doesn't lead to action. So we've got to avoid either the complacent optimism of that first culture, which is a social and political culture, or the fatalistic pessimism of the second. We have to be unsettled enough to want to engage with some boldness and some urgency in purposeful action, but not so unsettled as to lie flat. That should be our orientation. My second point is that transition paths are the key, not just the setting of distant goals on when we achieve net zero. The goals are important, they're an extremely important marker, but transition paths are critical. You would have heard this morning from Minister Grace Fu talking about Singapore's transition path, how we're setting targets, and how we intend to meet our targets. And we know that there was a shift in COP28, the inaugural global stock take that took place was really focused on the implementation of transition paths. But we are very far from where we have to be 
in closing the gap between commitments and action, even just commitments for 2030 and action. On current projections, current policies, current actions by the corporate sector, we're going to achieve about 5% of the reduction in carbon emissions that countries have committed to collectively by 2030, just 5%. And it's not a question of whether or not we achieve transition. The only choice we face is between an orderly transition and a disorderly transition. And we are currently on the path to an extremely disorderly transition post-2030. That's the choice. Either an orderly transition, just, equitable, fair sharing of the burden, or a disorderly and painful transition which very likely, too, will be most unjust. That's the choice. There's another reason why we have to take transition paths very seriously. And that is that we do know that we are very likely underestimating the scale of global warming that is going to take place. And that the reason for that is that the best models that we have, even the models of the IPCC, are unable to model extremities. We don't have enough data from the last 50 years on extremities to be able to model what really happens as things get more extreme. We don't have the data or even the models to estimate what happens when we cross tipping points, be it in the Antarctic or the boreal forests, or in the chemistry of the oceans. We don't have the models or the data, but we know that the risk is in one direction. It's not, it's not an upside and a downside, and we don't know what's going to happen. It's only a question of how serious the downside risk is. And that's another reason why we have to take the transition path so seriously. Don't risk crossing the tipping points. Every tenth of a percentage point, every 0 0.1 degree centigrade counts, and we should take that very seriously. So that's my second point. The transition paths are key, not just the setting of distant goals. My third point, I finished the appetizer, so I've come to the main cause, and I'll try to be a bit more positive. My third point is this is a massive opportunity. The trillions of dollars we talk about as being necessary for us to achieve net zero, first to get to 2030 and then to achieve net zero, those trillions of dollars are not a cost. They are an investment for growth, jobs, and an inclusive future. The world has not seen for a very long time the opportunity to boost growth and jobs and to spur the development progress, the development path for more than half of humanity. We've just never seen that opportunity and we now have this opportunity. We are well past the thinking that acting to mitigate and adapt to climate change is a cost you pay today to avoid some painful cost in the future. It's not just that. Acting to, in, on mitigation and adaptation for climate change is a massive opportunity for benefits today, not just avoiding a cost in the future. Benefits with regard to growth, with regard to jobs, including creating jobs for displaced workers and power sectors and other areas. Benefits in terms of improved crop yields and farmers' incomes. Benefits for clean air today. And you have to remember that polluted air kills millions of people every year all over the world, and particularly in the developing world. These are benefits today. And benefits in providing people with some protection from the extreme events that already exist, already come today the massive floods, the droughts, the heat waves, 
all the extremities. They're already with us. But those are benefits today. So the politics of climate change has to shift from talking about the costs we pay today to avoid costs in some distant future to the benefits we get today. Growth, jobs, cleaner air, where I live, better incomes for those who've been at the bottom, and our ability to protect ourselves from the extreme events that are now part and parcel of the world. My fourth point is that this is also an opportunity for us to remodel our economies, to develop collaborative economies focused on sustainability and equity. It's an opportunity to remodel our economies so that you do not have the public sector and the private sector in silos and the philanthropic sector doing good by way of charity. But you have co-investment and you have all three parties taking risks and expecting rewards together. It's a huge opportunity to remodel what we think of as a market economy and to combine forces through the sharing of risk and rewards to achieve a common mission. And sustainability and equity are our largest common missions within countries and globally. And in that regard, I think we are now at a pivotal point in philanthropy. In Asia, as you are discussing, and in a very useful direction in my view, as well as philanthropy globally. We have to shift from thinking of philanthropy as doing good towards thinking of philanthropy as risk capital. Because we cannot solve this problem without a class of investors that has the ability to take risk on early stage innovations, the ability to take a long view of returns, and the ability to think not only of financial returns, but social returns to think of impact and social returns. And this new philanthropy needs to be mobilized, needs to work in concert with the private sector and the public sector. Think of philanthropy first and foremost as risk capital. And there are many good examples from amongst you here and from your discussions. If you think of what Breakthrough Energy, for instance, is doing to fund large-scale demonstration projects in some of the emerging low-carbon te uh, technologies, or investing in first-in-kind commercial-scale projects in emerging technologies. I think that's very useful. And if you think of what's necessary, not just in early-stage innovation, but in mature technologies needing to be scaled up globally, across the developing world especially, where there's still very little application of the mature technologies required for us to have low carbon growth. That too requires a mix of capital. Commercial capital has been slow to invest in these areas, but a mix of capital, a blend of capital, philanthropic, public, multilateral, and private sector should surely be able to scale up mature technologies in energy, in more efficient use of energy, as well as critically in the revolution in agriculture that we need. And we, too, we also need, in this whole process, to develop our own capacities, capacities within the philanthropic sector and the ability to constantly compare and spread best practices amongst each other. And I think you're, you're now off on that path in a very encouraging way. 
what you're doing through the Asia Center for Changemakers that Tomasic Trust has started, as well as the Center for Impact Investment and Practices, is aimed precisely at that. Develop capabilities, spread best practices. And there's a whole set of Singapore-based conveners now that have this broad aim. Asian Venture Philanthropy Network, the Asian Philanthropy Circle, Asia Community Foundations. Notice I'm spelling them out in full so I don't have to have acronyms that will confuse everyone. Um, but it's, it's very encouraging. It's a collaborative mindset now. And globally, you've got Gaia, which the World Economic Fund has, has been leading with many partners around the world. Same purpose, same purpose. It's not a competition. It's about collaborating, spreading best practices. And it's all about thinking about this as risk capital. My fifth point, and I suppose I now come to dessert, which should be a little sweeter, is that in the same way that we think about this as risk capital, we have to realize that the central challenge we face has to do with innovation. And it's a very exciting challenge. Innovation, not just in what we talk about so often, which is about the shift towards renewable energies and the gradual phase out of fossil fuels, but innovation in each and every sector of the economy, every vertical, so to speak, so as to improve energy efficiency and to develop circularity. And that's an enormous gain across each of our economies and globally. And that too is where the combination of philanthropic, private and public capital is required and we are already seeing some impressive early gains. I spoke about agriculture. That transformation is probably the most neglected, but it's critical. Critical for methane and greenhouse gas emissions, critical for water overconsumption, critical for avoiding the endless encroaching into natural ecosystems, deforestation. We have to revolutionize agriculture and have a new green revolution. And it involves specific projects with new technologies being scaled up. One of them, by the way, is to revolutionize rice farming, decarbonize or demethanize rice, but also go for strains and cultivation methods that involve far less water use can be achieved. Low carbon cement, green steel, which is on, on the video, and more efficient running of buildings to use far less energy. Taking off, still early stage, at least for cement and steel, but they're no longer what we should regard us as regard, regard as hard to abate sectors. The technologies are emerging, not yet commercially viable, but it's where risk capital has to move into. Closer to consumers, what we don't focus on enough, the textile industry, the fast fashion industry. I don't think I, as a post, as a late 60s individual, should be lecturing people about how often they should change their, what they're wearing. But at the very least, we could go for circularity. At the very least. The textile industry contributes up to 10% of global emissions. Up to 10%, it's not small. And polyester is big in the textile industry, and polyester is made from oil. At the very least, we can go for circularity, and there's some very impressive innovations now. Again, not yet commercial scale, but they're very promising. So don't ignore textiles. Don't ignore what's close to consumers. And I took a quick glance at the menu before I walked up, by the way, and I'm glad they're not, not serving beef. Because that too, I mean, it shouldn't be called an innovation, but simple changes in diet 
without reducing our standard of living at all. In fact, it will increase our standard of living because we'll probably get healthier as well. Make a big difference. They make a big difference. So innovations in each and every area of life, quite apart from the dramatic change in the power sector that will have to take place over the next 30 years, changes within each and every activity of life need a lot more focus, and it's about innovation. Finally, I suppose this is the second dessert, um, we have to, you know, I really like your focus this year on natural ecosystems. Because we have to understand that's not just nice to have. We are not going to solve for climate if we don't solve for water and biodiversity at the same time. At the same time. They're intimately connected with each other. But it's actually an opportunity. Because when we solve for water, we're solving for food security, we're solving for biodiversity, because you can stop this endless removal of forests and natural ecosystems. And you also improve soil health and the ability to store carbon. Solving for water helps biodiversity and carbon and global warming. We all know how biodiversity is critical for carbon. That's obvious. But it's not just because of carbon. Biodiversity provides many other benefits to the human species. And we should respect that and find ways of valuing it, valuing nature, valuing natural capital, and eventually having it on our books and accounting for it. And of course, if we can mitigate climate change and global warming, we'll also be making it that much easier to get the global water cycle back in equilibrium and preserving our forests. So we now have a negative feedback loop between the three of them, but the opportunity is to create a positive feedback loop by addressing all three together. Because the sum of benefits that we get from addressing climate change, water and biodiversity together is much larger than the individual benefits we get from addressing one or the other. That's what it boils down to. We've got to address all three together, and it's a real opportunity because we then create a positive feedback loop. So let me conclude. We have to avoid complacent optimism, as well as catastrophic thinking, both of which breed in action. We have to recognize this as an opportunity for a new era of growth, new jobs, and inclusivity. We have to also treat it as an opportunity to remodel our economies for partnerships between the public and private sector and philanthropies playing a critical catalytic role through, their, through the risk capital they provide. And we've got to think holistically about ecological change that it's not just global warming, it's not just the floods and droughts, or the fact that two billion people don't have clean water every year, and it's not just the loss of forests and biodiversity. It's all three together, but that's an opportunity, because we can address the three together in ways that create benefits much larger than addressing each by themselves. So it is a glass half full, and we actually know how to fill it up. And it does require on collaboration across every sector and collaboration globally. And I believe we can achieve it. And I really want to thank you for your efforts, small and large, in creating this momentum towards that new way of thinking about our role in the world. Thank you very much.